I'm going to read some scripture to you. I'm going to go up there to preach. I'll read a scripture to you from down here. Um, and when I finish, I'm going to say, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And you can say, thanks be to God. There's another ritual you use here, but hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So listen to this, the first nine verses of the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis, first book of the Bible. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife, Sarah, and his brother's son, brother's son Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and all the persons whom they had, who had, had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they came forth, when they had come to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. And at that time the Canaanites were in the land. And when the Lord appeared to Abram, he said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there, to what appeared to, who appeared, to what appeared to him, and from there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the, on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. How many times in your life have you moved? Have you actually moved from the first time you can remember until now? Someone has said that the average American moves every 5.2 years. I don't know how they get that statistic, but that's what they say. Sometimes you move for an upgrade, sometimes for a matter of restlessness, sometimes it's because of a job change or a transfer, sometimes it's just for a change of scenery. You can move across town or across the state or across the country. The story of Abraham in the Old Testament is a story of a man on a major move. In the 12th chapter of Genesis, in the first verse, the scripture says, God says to Abraham, leave your country, your father's home, for a land that I will show you. And Abraham moved. It was a major upheaval for him. It was 500 miles. 500 miles is not an extraordinary long distance for us today, but back 5,000 years ago when this took place, it was a major undertaking. He took his family, he took his extended family, he took all his possessions and his livestock, and he moved. Abram's father had moved them once before when they were in a place called Ur. He moved to a place called Haran, and there's where Abraham grew up, and that's where he got married, and that's where he raised his family, and that's where he was at the time when God called him. Uh, but when he was 75 years old, just when he was beginning to enjoy his AARP discounts, <laughs> just when he was beginning to enjoy his Social Security and his pension, God says, Abraham, I want you to move. God sends him packing for a major relocation. The story of Abraham is a major story in the Old Testament. Because Abraham is literally the father of three great world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And he's revered by all three. And his story is their story, and his story is our story as well. So Abraham is one towering figure in religious history. He's considered, considered to be the first monotheist, that is the first person to believe in one God. Now the question this morning is, why is this story preserved for us? Why has this story been passed down for almost 5,000 years? Some people say, well, you know, this wasn't any big deal. Maybe it was just a midlife crisis for Abraham. Well, 75 is a little late to have a midlife crisis. <laughs> or maybe they say he was just moving like they all did back in those days. They were all nomads, Bedouins they were sometimes called. Everybody was on the move. But I think this story is different. I think Abraham is different. There's a reason why this story has been preserved in the scriptures down through all the centuries of time. I think there's a lesson for us in the story of Abraham, and I'd like you to listen to that lesson this morning if you can. We learn from his story, and his story informs yours and my faith journey. For one thing, the story tells us that Abraham had a real sense of the presence of God. A real sense of the presence of God. Several times in the story it says he built an altar, and there he prayed. Sunday school teacher was quizzing the class one time and she said, 
why do you love God? One little boy raised his hand and said, well, I guess it runs in the family. <laughs> well, Abraham began a new family of faithful people. Abraham lived life deeply. Abraham was what I call God connected. He had a strong sense of the presence of God in his life. You might even say he was unusually well wired. Some of you have a greater connectivity to God than others. I mean, you're better or worse. It's just that you happen to have it. Others, not, as, not so much. Abraham had, a, uh, for some reason, a great connectivity with God. He was linked to his God. He didn't know where he was going. God said, I'll go take you to a land that I will show you when you get there. But he had a compelling, overarching, overwhelming call. And he had to go. Years ago, I went whitewater rafting with a youth group down the Yokogany River. It was a chilly early fall day. It was raining. We had 30 plus rafts. Uh, and I was in one of those rafts, one of those rubber rafts with three 16 year old girls. <laughs> and down the river we went, paddling furiously, bumping into rocks, often getting stuck, falling in and out for four solid hours in the pouring down rain. And I asked myself several times during that trip, why am I doing this? <laughs> why am I doing this? Abraham didn't ask that question. Now, I don't know that he was perfect. I don't know that you would call him a saint, but he had strong convictions. God got Abraham's attention. For too many of us, God has simply not gotten our attention. We lack some of the great convictions of life because we don't have God's attention. I'm a part of a covenant discipleship group in my retirement. David Lutz, who attends this church, is uh, in that group. Bishop George Bayshore, who preached here a couple weeks ago, is in the group. There are seven, nine of us all together. We meet once a month. And one of the questions we ask ourselves, the theme of our meeting together is, are we celebrating God as the central focus of our lives? That's the way Abraham lived. That's the way you and I are called to live. Dom Helder Camera, who was the Bishop of Brazil. He died in 1999. He was about 90 plus years of age. He's known inter internationally and even locally as a man of God. He once wrote these words. The noise that prevents us from hearing the voice of God is not, is truly not the clamor of man or the racket of the cities, still less the stirring of the wind or the whispering of the water. The noise that completely smothers the voice of God is the inner uproar of unsleeping ambition. We may be so busy trying to get ahead, we may just be so busy, period, that we do not hear the voice of God. I remember a movie from a few years ago starring Jack Lemmon. Jack Lemmon played the part of a, of a comedian who was the master of one-liners. It alienated his family, but his friends loved it. The movie opens when this character played by Jack Wilman goes to the hospital for some tests. And he learns he has a terminal blood disease, some form of cancer. And he spends the next one or two days wrestling with the conflict between his comic lifestyle and this news that he's just been given. And in one scene, his estranged wife asks him, did the doctor have any suggestions? And he says, well, for one thing, the doctor told me to get religion. And then he reflects, he says, I guess God never got much, much attention in my life. Is that not our real vulnerability? We're so busy, we're so ambitious that God doesn't get much of our attention. And when God doesn't get our attention, we lack some of the great convictions of life. God got Abraham's attention. That's what the story is about. Abraham had a clear sense of the presence of God. And that's our discipleship challenge today or at least part of it. Another thing the story teaches us is that Abraham trusted God for direction. Two New Yorkers were traveling through the state of Louisiana and they came upon the town of Natchitoches. And they argued with each other about how to pronounce the name of the town. They argued back and forth until they stopped for lunch. They stopped at a fast food restaurant for lunch. And they got there and they stood at the counter and one of the men leaned over the counter and said to the manager, before we order, would you please pronounce the name of where we are would you pronounce it very slowly? The manager leaned forward and said, Burger King. <laughs> Abraham did not ask God where he was going or how to pronounce the name of it. He trusted and he went. 
He had no GPS, no global positioning system, no map. He, retire, he re, relied entirely upon God's direction. You know, the, the great American philosopher, Yogi Berra, who says, you've got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might get there. <laughs> Recently, I heard this word from a young preacher. He said, I promise you, follow Jesus and your life will become unstable. Follow Jesus and your life will become unstable. That was true for Abraham. It could also be true for us. A clergy colleague of mine writes these words. In Genesis, Abraham is minding his own business in Haran when God comes to him one day and says, start walking. And if Abraham wants to know where and why, God's answer is essentially, I'll show you when you get there. Abraham becomes the father of the faithful because he's willing to walk with God even when he has no idea where he is going. I was ordained an elder 49 years ago this past summer and appointed to my first church. I got a call when I was still in seminary as to where I was going. They said, we've appointed you to Circleville. I said, where's that? Well, you'll find out when you get there. <laughs> I knew there was a Circleville in Ohio. I had no idea there was a Circleville in Pennsylvania or Western Pennsylvania. Found out it was someplace near Irwin. I'd never been to Irwin either, okay? But I went, I went. And I was there for seven years. Now I'm, I'm not putting myself up as an Abraham and I'm not saying the bishop is the voice of God, but it's a sense of that. If you don't know where you're going, you trust God to guide you and to get you there. I believe God was calling. And so my wife and I packed up our broken down Ford Falcon and our six week old firstborn son and all of the possessions we could get into that car and we went. And we were there for seven years. 33 years ago, I was called and asked to go to a very large church. I had no idea about it. I had no expectation that we would be there. We had no real sense of well, even what, we, what it was about. I didn't know what it meant, but I believed God was leading. God's leading is not always absolutely clear. I wanna be clear that I say that. God's leading is not always absolutely clear. Sometimes it's a gentle nudging, sometimes it's a kind of a prompting of the spirit. But for Abraham, the call seems to have been crystal clear. For you and me, perhaps not quite so much. Abraham is revered because of his dramatic response. It didn't matter that he was 75 years old. It didn't matter that all his earth, earthly goods were secure in one place. It didn't matter that he was comfortable and content. If this God was real, and Abraham was convinced that God was real. If this God was real, he obeyed. He's not sure where he was headed, but he trusted God as the guide. I saw a t-shirt not too long ago that said, I chose the road less traveled. Now where the heck am I? <laughs> Abraham chose the road less traveled. He trusted God to know where he was, and he trusted God to know where he was headed. And so Abraham becomes a mentor for your faith journey and for mine. To live in the constant awareness of God, to trust God at every step, and to keep on moving. And that's another point of the story. Abraham kept moving. I read a story about an alumnus of MIT who came across then President Emeritus Jerome Wiesner. And, and this uh, alumnus said to President Wiesner, do you remember me? You shook my hand at graduation and said something to me that became the secret of my successful career. Wiesner said, my goodness, what did I say? You said, keep moving, keep moving. <laughs> the only real choice for a follower of Jesus is to keep moving, to keep growing. Growth is our only real option. We met that covenant group I mentioned a few minutes ago. We met a uh, time or two ago, and we shared the answer around the circle to the question, what is the growing edge of your life right now? Didn't matter that most of us were in our 70s, some of us in our 80s. Didn't matter how old we were. What is the growing edge of your life right now? You cannot follow Jesus without moving. And you cannot move without leaving something behind. God said to Abraham, Go into an unknown region for incomprehensible purposes. I will go with you. I will show you the way and I will make something of you. As I reflect upon this story, I like to think that Abraham lived in a different time zone. 
You know, we're in daylight savings time today, DST. I think Abraham lived in DST too, but it was divine standard time. Let me give you a kind of an illustration that may help with this. I, if I'm sitting at my computer at two o'clock in the afternoon and I have a problem that I need to call a technician about, I'll place the phone call and I get a technician in Bangkok where it is one o'clock in the morning. So I'm talking to him tomorrow and he's talking to me yesterday. Think about it, it's really strange. God's timing is very different from our own. The story of Abraham reminds us of this. And when you understand this, life takes on a whole new dimension. John Bailey, a favorite writer of mine, has a fascinating prayer. I think it's on the screen. I want you to hear this prayer. Oh, eternal God, grant me this day a clear conviction of your reality and power. Let me not go forth into this day believing only in the world of sense and time, but give me grace to understand that the world I cannot see or touch is the most real world of all. I really like that prayer. I think Abraham could have prayed that prayer. Abraham had this strong sense of God. He had the sense that God's timing was different from his own timing and that neither Ur or Haran or Canaan was his final home. Abraham knew that he lived in a much larger universe than he could touch or feel or see. Abraham's soul had been invaded by God. I invite you to let your soul be invaded by God. Abraham was attentive and responsive to God's call. I invite you to be attentive and responsive to whatever call God is issuing in your life. Abraham found a new adventure, new opportunities, new happiness, and so will you. What I'm doing this morning is inviting you to let this ancient forebear of our faith become a mentor for your faith journey in the 21st century. Let's bow in prayer. Thank you, God, for the story of Abraham, for the faith that upheld him and led him forward. Guide us and help us to learn from that story and to grow from that story so that we too may be ready for whatever the next adventure of our life might be in your scheme of things. Give us the grace to say yes and to be ready to go. In Jesus' name, amen.